Um, so yeah, as I was saying, I think this is going to be the theatrical premiere, the first time we've seen Jennifer's body in a cinema. So wow. that's cool. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of take us back to the beginning of this film. So back to 2008, because I understand you came on board sort of early in, in 2008. What was it that sort of attracted you to this, to Diablo Cody's script originally? Uh, her script was so smart. It was so funny. Um, I saw a lot of opportunity to feel genuinely afraid while I was watching the movie, but I also thought it was just hilarious. Like reading the script, I, I laughed out loud. Like it was that kind of funny for me and, and, and that idea of sort of the secret language between girls, um, made perfect sense to me. And it, it the, the script really spoke to me as a story about, about friendships between high school girls and, and the pressures they feel to, um, well, ultimately destroy each other. Um, and how difficult it is to, to just be a loyal, good friend. Um, when you're living in a punishing patriarchy. <laughs> and, and at the time, I mean, you, like, so Diablo had just sort of just come over, she was about to win the Oscar. Yes. Even Fox, of course, was really huge or becoming really huge. Did you feel, as you started to shoot the film, did you feel that was a sort of a pressure for you or not? Uh, I didn't, I, I, I was aware of how much attention both of them got. Um, I was aware of a lot of just sort of film community chatter about about Diablo and um, and a, and a, what felt like a pretty gendered um, critique of her every move, mm -hmm. um, her every word, her every dress, her every pair of shoes. It just felt like everything was so scrutinized with Diablo and with Megan. Um, in some ways, I, I didn't quite see how easily she had been targeted in such a such a discriminatory way um, because so much of the stuff that were things blew up on the uh, among the Transformers crew and mm. she she sort of became embroiled in this conflict with Michael Bay. I I was surprised by how virulent and public and um, just how noisy the conversation was around that. Um, so I was I was aware that there was a lot of um, talk around both of them, but I, I I wasn't quite aware of how it would impact the final film. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly remember the noise at the time when the film was released. But going yeah. back to the sort of like nice little I guess space that you had when you were shooting the film, what was that like on set? Was it a good shoot? Uh Oh, it was a wonderful experience. I mean, um, Diablo was there a lot. It, I always love having a writer on set. And um, we just, she she's just so smart and funny and sees the world in such a particular way. And her wit is incredibly intelligent and acerbic. Um, and we really did kind of create this lovely community of actors. Um, Amanda Seyfried and Megan Fox and Johnny Simmons and Kyle Gallner. Um, there were just so many, you know, a, 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 a then barely known Chris Pratt. There were just like a lot of great, lovely um, Adam Brody. You know, there were just like a lot of lovely actors on set and it created a really nice, fun vibe. I had a lot of fun making the movie. Did you find that, I mean, you're a fan of horror comedy reading a lot of the, the yeah. interviews. And did you find that you brought something, um, I mean, a, a lot of it's there in Diablo's script, of course. Were there opportunities for you to add sort of little things on set when you were shooting? Um, yeah, there were actually. I mean, we, we, we had to, something that came up as we were making the film was the, um, the, the, the rules of demon possession, you know, and, and at a certain point I felt like what we have to do is establish some idea of how you destroy this all powerful demon. And so, you know, to me, it felt like let's just do a kind of mashup of, of Dracula and of a couple of other sort of uh, myths and just say that, you know, it, 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 it takes a stake to the heart for, 
for Jennifer to to uh, finally, you know, be saved essentially from her possession. Um, but that also allowed for this interesting idea to emerge, which was did did Jennifer have a heart in the first place? Um, you know, because she's um, there's something quite cruel about the character, and she's made more cruel by the demon possession. But um, so I was able, we were able to play around with certain ideas that um, weren't necessarily in in the script. But for the most part, I, I, I'm all, I'm very loyal to any of the screenplays that I work with. Mm -hmm. I like that, like Diego has said on a few occasions, that she tried to write hard, but just couldn't help herself to but finding the whole situation funny. And I mean, <laughs> when you watch this film, it's it is so even in its most awful moments like the sacrifice it's, yes. it's a horrible scene but it's also very funny at the same time yeah. um in in certain ways of course and i think that um that the way you guys create this horror comedy is something that's very tricky to do um i wanted to go back and i know you've talked about this before but there's a very funny interview that you did with i think indywire where you talked about an experience and i think it's sort of key to some of this tone of this film is you talked about the experience of watching the race ahead with your mom. Oh yeah. Yeah. Can you tell that story for, for our audience? Oh, sure. Um, one of my most profound, uh, early cinema experiences was to go to our local repertory screening theater, um, and see David Lynch's Eraserhead when it was released the theatrically in 1977. Um, and, or 78. And, um, my mom took me and my brother and my sister, I was 10. Um, my brother was eight and my sister was seven years old. And, um, for those who haven't seen the film, it's, um, black and white. It's, um, essentially a surrealist portrait of a man and a woman he has some kind of sexual experience with, and then she's suddenly pregnant and gives birth to basically an animal fetus of some kind, but far from human. Um, and it's a, it's a crazy movie to see as a child. Um, and a friendly film. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, what's funny is we, we would see family films at that theater. We would go together and see creature from the black lagoon and, 3D and you know Fantasia and you know we would see movies there as a family, but but this was probably the the wrong choice. But um, but you know of course it ended up being a watershed moment for me because first of all I saw what it did to my brother and sister. They were sobbing hysterically, and my mom asked me to take them out to the lobby because she was actually really enjoying the movie and um, it's well, just. Well, thank you. Say again. Your mom was laughing during the, the baby. The oh, baby she thought it was hilarious. She, she thought it was such a funny movie. And when I think about it now, of course, the movie is so much about the anxiety of, of pregnancy, of, of female sexuality, of giving birth. But but primarily, it's it's a movie about the anxiety of being a parent and the responsibility that comes with it. And, and it was just in retrospect, one of those really funny movies to think about in Freudian terms and, and or something like that, imagining my, my mom, maybe finally feeling like somebody gets her, um, you know, overwhelmed with three kids who are basically, you know, spaced a year apart from one another. Um, it was a really amazing experience for me, incredibly memorable to have to want to see the film but protect my siblings so i watched it through the portal windows of the lobby doors it sounds like a very formative experience yes greatly i think in your filmmaking um, i wanted to just talk about a few of the great moments in this film so i'm very curious to see whose idea uh they were first of all um i don't think we can not comment on jk simmons claw ah. uh, <laughs> was that something in the screenplay or did you it was um, always in the screenplay yeah. i mean okay. that that's like one of those things that is just so um in a way kind of typical of diablo is she just um 
she just adds details that give a director a lot to work with and a lot to think about. And, um, and JK just loved like, you know, kind of throwing his weight around with, with, with the, with the prosthetic arm. It was quite amazing. It, it, it he really. Explanation. Yeah. Floor. Just the claw was, he just has a claw. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a, of a detour, but um, when yes. The issue is a great moment. He extends the, with the claw. Okay. That might've been me. I might've, I might've said, guys, <laughs> if we're going to do this, let's milk it. <laughs> I think that might've been one of the funniest bits in the film. <laughs> uh, the nine eleven shot drinks also quite genius. I don't know whose detail that was. The the nine eleven the shot drinks when they get at they're at the bar. Oh yeah. It, that was always in the script. But we we made them red, white, and blue. Like we decided to make them um red, white, and blue shooters. <laughs> a very nice touch. <laughs> um yes. In, in keeping with the tragedy boner um theme of the script, of course. Yes. Um this this film, I mean, I, I know you've talked about this quite a lot, surprisingly, in the in the last year, given that yeah. it's sort of resurfaced in a weird way. Yeah. But this is sort of historically must be one of the most mismarketed films uh, in the history of you know cinema marketing. I, I don't think I'm exaggerating. I'm on that mantle. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's something to be to claim it with great pride, but. Uh, <laughs> Going back to that, I mean, again, you've talked about how there was so much focus on Diablo, so much focus on Megan. Um, this, I mean, you've told some funny stories about this as well, um, in terms of how this film was marketed. And I remember when it came out, the trailers that were very sort of sort of set to titillate. There was a lot of focus on Megan being yeah. sexual. There was yeah. a lot of emotional push with the, um, you know, Amanda and Megan's kiss. Yes. What's going through your minds that? your mind and also Diablo's mind at the time. Are you, I know you sort of feuded a little bit with the studio. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, it's funny, I'm a really polite person, but I can't resist um, sharing my opinion uh, when it comes to my own work. And so to see, to see that there, there were literally first cuts of trailers that didn't have Amanda Seyfried in them. So, so you didn't understand that she was the main character. Um, and, you know, she had just come off of um, Mamma Mia and she had a very, very funny, memorable role in Mean Girls. And and people really just liked her so much as an actor. And so it was really um, kind of startling to me to see that they weren't including her in the marketing materials because while you could argue that the movie stars Megan Fox, you know, the main character is really played by Amanda Seyfried. And, and so it, it was, um, it didn't bode well for the rest of the process that that's how those initial trailers were put together and conceived. Um, and it, it started to feel pretty weird, pretty fast. I mean, there were moments where I just knew, um, they were not embracing um, the the female centric team creatively behind the movie. They weren't particularly respectful in in my mind of the roles that the two female leads were playing um, because they were sort of distorting the meaning of the movie. Um, And I, I guess I just feel like what I was most disappointed by was that it didn't seem like they believed in the female audience. Mm -hmm. Um, They, you know, it's almost like they didn't want to, they just didn't want to sell the movie to women. Um, And without really acknowledging that the story is about, yes, a, a, a beautiful girl who becomes possessed by a demon, but who, who eats boys like, you know, pulls their intestines out of their body. And um, it was a weird, it was a weird, um, like, just crossed wires kind of situation where I, I felt like departments weren't really talking to each other to understand what the movie was that they were marketing. There's, there's that infamous email that you say you received from the studio which you sort of commented on the the, tra- on the poster, which had said, you know, 
uh, about Jennifer sort of eating roids and they just said back, what was the response that the, the poster had said, um, she'll, um, she's got a taste for bad boys and you questioned that. Yes. And the studio sent you an email, which was quite funny. Yes, what it, um, I'm trying to remember because it was so um, kind of caveman, so not Neanderthal in its language that I'm honestly having a hard time recalling the exact oversimplicity of it, but it was something like, Jennifer hot, she kill you, she's <laughs> like, she eats your boyfriend, like something just so Jennifer so hot. I think, it, I think it was Jennifer sexy, she steal your boyfriend. Yes. And that, I mean, that, was, that was the grammar behind it. Yes, it, it was almost like they couldn't even bother to, to write complete sentences to us, which, um, <laughs> Another thing, if you know me at all, it's like I'm not a fan of of today's uh, sort of casual patter. I'm I'm um, even when I passed notes in high school, I I wrote in complete sentences and fully formed paragraphs. So I'm just not a um, a great candidate for receiving those kinds of emails or reading them. Amen. This is yeah. Uh, it's it's funny. Just going back to what you were saying before. Um, I hadn't actually seen the director's cut of this film, which we've just screened, uh, and it does, by opening with Amanda's needy story in the prison, it gives you a much clearer sense of the fact that this is her story and the film yeah. is about her. Why, um, I'm gathering that the studio recut that sequence at the time, or what? Well, I think, think it's funny, it's, it, that was, um, you know, look, I appreciate both versions of the film. I think my version is better. Um, my version is probably more complicated, more complex. Um, the opening of the film was something that I think people, they, they, they wanted a sort of, the studio was hoping for kind of less buildup and, and something that just sort of pulled you right in mm -hmm. to some essential conflict. I'm not, you know, I'm not convinced that, I, th I think the, the, the theatrically released version does that as well. The biggest version between my cut and the studio's cut was that, um, or I call it the studio cut, because I, I, I was still, you know, very much uh, in charge of that cut. But my cut, my original cut just spent more time focusing on the fact that these boys were actually real people and their deaths were meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was this idea that, that having the boys be actual victims um, that you felt something for, or you felt the reverberation of a crime through this community, um, even in the heightened way that I treated it, it was that it was considered a little too, too sad. I mean, too emotionally real. Um, and believe me, as a filmmaker, it's very difficult to have, you know, people from the studio say, you know, it, it can be fair, funny, it can be scary, but it can't also be sad. It, it has to have, you know, you sort of have to choose, choose your, your genre mashup Mm. Which, you know, it doesn't make sense, though, does it? I mean, they, that's, that's someone who hasn't obviously seen an, an American werewolf in London, for example, which is funny and scary and also sad. Well, and that's the thing is, I guess to me, I just felt like I, I, I feel a tremendous sense of um, responsibility in how I depict violence, and so it was important to me that the consequences be real. And so unfortunately, in having to sort of pull out a lot of that material around those boys, mm -hmm. um, it, it, in some ways it, it just diminished, you know, the, the fact that this was sort of, that the, that the guys themselves weren't bad guys. They, they weren't meant to be, um, it's not a revenge film. They're, they're not meant to be, you know, um, oppressive jerks. Um, Actually, the oppressive jerk is the guy who benefits the most. And ritual itself, and eventually he does get his comeuppance. But um, it was very interesting 
to, to recognize that that multiplicity of emotional threads what was harder for the studio to to digest uh, for, for those in the audience that haven't seen the theatrical cut um i believe the the funeral uh, sequence was one of was not in the original that yeah. something was you put back in so yeah. that's a is it a sense of sort of the lives around these boys and that yeah. sense of tragedy beyond just the main story yes well and it's funny because the script had always been about um, all of the boys getting, you know, all of them being people who had parents. Mm -hmm. um, and so it never ended up in my, even my director's cut, but there's, there's stuff between, you know, Roman Duda, the, the police officer played by Chris Pratt, you know, fi finding, not just finding Chip's body, but then, delivering the news to Chip's mom and, and, and she sort of collapses to the floor. And there was a lot of stuff in the, in the movie that we just didn't have the space for. It was, it was almost uh, taking us away from other more essential storylines, but, um, but the whole, the whole story, the whole screenplay had been conceived to not just be about Jennifer and needy, but about a world that gets turned upside down by this possession. Mm -hmm. it, it's when the, when this film came out. It, I mean, given the way the marketing was orchestrated, it was very much a film that was sold to a young straight male audience. Yeah. There, thereby negating the audience that it was kind of really made for. Yes. When the reviews started coming in. I mean, looking back at. I mean, I'm looking at the the Rotten Tomatoes census. Uh, critics consensus the head headline is literally jennifer's body is hot but the movie isn't and that was a summary of all the reviews that came out that week um as i'm sure you, you know you remember i mean there was some positive reviews roger ebert gave a somewhat positive review but at the same time called the movie twilight for boys which i'm not sure what that means exactly yeah and sort of vaguely lamented that you can or infer that it's a shame that Megan Fox kept her shirt on, whereas Robert Pattinson kept, you know, took his shirt off. So there was just this theme of like, I'm sorry to have to, re you know, have you relive this stuff. But what are your thoughts at the time? And there was such a theme of like, is it the marketing people's fault that they sold this movie as a straight male kind of, you know, hot girl gets revenge, and therefore reviewers were primed to see it in a certain way, which it then wasn't. Yeah. What we what were your thoughts so oh, I, I, mean, I think it's a classic bait and switch marketing move um it, it was an idea of getting the getting the audience into the theater and then not giving them the thing you said they were going to see um but it, it it colored so many responses to the film um the way that it was marketed cover colored the way female critics um, often reviewed the film and assumed that I was sort of working for the man um, by making this film, which to me was a real um, disappointment um, because I think the movie is clearly um, has its origins in a feminist statement um i'm a feminist diablo is a feminist i i think it's so obvious that we care about girls and love them and love the young people we depict and showed them with respect within the within the frequency with which we were working you know um it's a, it's a crazy horror comedy so there's a lot about the script that was always politically incorrect, um, but that's comedy in many respects. And so I was disappointed by how easily people are, um, how the framing of the marketing actually uh, frames the entire conversation around the film. And the film itself is one of the first casualties of that process. It must be, I mean, However delayed the response has been, it must be satisfying to see this sudden, and where it came from, I'm not really sure, but where, where do you think this sort of sudden 
resurgence of interest in Jennifer's body came, um, which for those that aren't aware, there was uh, quite a number of articles uh, last year. There was one in Vice, in BuzzFeed, in Vox, which sort of said, hang on a minute, Jennifer's body was a great film and everybody was wrong. And I mean, it wasn't even the 10 year, I mean, this is the 10 year anniversary, but this was a weird nine year anniversary. And everybody, was it because you were doing press for Destroyer? I mean, why did, where do you think this came from? I think, I mean, I think there were some people who really loved Jennifer's body when it came out. And, you know, with, with a kind of um, the sense of passion that, that young people particularly can can apply to the areas of their life that they feel are particularly misunderstood. And, um, and, and I hope that's a testament to the fact that the movie was really attempting to speak to those, the kind of kids who would be passionate fans, you know? Um, I think there was something about, even before I really started doing press, there was something about the Brett Kavanaugh hearings in the United States that had a spooky, um, just a sense of deja vu again on a public stage again. And this time, some of the most powerful perches in the, in the world we see yet again are being filled with credibly accused predators <laughs> and that that felt really um it's a dark time in america it's a dark time all over the world but i feel like something um i, I mean i have a lot of friends who said it's so weird i watched jennifer's body again i felt like i needed to watch it again and it came off of those hearings and i kind of wonder if there was just a feeling about having a president of the United States who just admits admits freely to assaulting women and not caring. If there was just something about the, um, I'm going to just say it, the evil of it that just started to feel like, oh, maybe I should like revisit that movie that um, that made me feel uncomfortable or laugh or feel like in a way, you know, women when women aren't being victimized by men, then they're victimizing each other in this system. And, and the proof of that was watching female senators on the Republican side vote this guy to a lifetime appointment on the Supreme Court. So, you know, I think, I just wonder if like the confluence of political, you know, climate and current events with just the sense of, um, just the sense of how rare it is that you even see movies like this um, with girls at their core uh, who aren't part of franchises. Um, it's probably one of the few movies people could revisit of its kind. I, I think it's interesting you said that this assists doing more uh, you know, a landscape that drives women against each other. And there were some some of the criticisms from, I mean, looking at some of the criticisms from one of the female critics at the time, uh, Kira Cochran in The Guardian said that it, in the end it was just another catfight between girls. But what you point out, and I think what comes through in the movie, is it's the environment that's driven Jennifer and Moody oh, uh, yeah. sort of against each other. So that's not necessarily a sort of an, an, an anti-feminist um, no, not at all. And and I mean, I'm sorry, but I take my genre movie rule seriously. And if if there's no way to to banish the demon, she she's she's possessed. And so the only release that she is going to have is to at least be restored to her human form in death. I mean, I, I personally feel like if you're not a fan of the genre, I get it, but I, I hate having my movies be reduced like that when people haven't done their homework or care about the genre they claim to comment or be critical of. Mm. A lot of critics don't always do their homework, I guess. <laughs> yes, exactly. I, I was wondering, do you think it's, I mean, it was pointed out at the time how the, the split among critics was large, slightly weighted in terms of male reviewers and that the male reviewers at the time tended to give the film 
worst reviews than the female reviewers, you know, for yeah. whatever that's worth. Do you think, I mean, I think we're starting to possibly see that change where there's at least an awareness of the need for more voices. Oh, sure. that, that sort of, the fact that there are at least, you know, motions to have more voices in the critical um, dialogue. Do you think this has factored into Jennifer's body being reappreciated? Now that there are other voices out there who are like, hold on, we get this movie and what it was about. Yeah, I think that that's that's completely possible. I mean, I, um, you know, there there are so um, there is such an imbalance of within the critical community of um, of women's voices, of people of colors' voices, and so it has been something we're starting to pay attention to. I still think power rests with older white men um, and they continue to get, you know, just based, you know, you could argue to, to, to play devil's advocate, I suppose, based on their, their long running, you know, high perches, um, they keep getting placed at other high perches when everything gets um, shifted, you know, one conglomerate shifts into another. And it seems like these guys just kind of move around from one place to another. Whereas women often are driven out of, out of being film critics. Um, I think that there's a real, this is an interesting moment where we have to look at kind of, we have to consider all kinds of factors in how movies are perceived and, um, absorbed by the culture, you know, um, there was, in my memory, almost no women in the marketing team, you know, when they were marketing Jennifer's body. And wow. so that creates a real um, cognitive dissonance almost because there seemed to be a lack of understanding from the beginning of what the movie was. Um, but I think this is something that, that, that kind of um, filters out to everything when you think about how few women are the heads of festival juries or how, you know, how infrequently they are on the selection committee for world-class festivals infrequently. It, 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 it's disheartening because there are so many doors that get opened for a lot of filmmakers, um, but not if the, the people who are the gatekeepers kind of don't see how, how your film relates to them. It's a tough one. And you've also expressed sort of a concern about having to be regarded as a female film yeah. filmmaker all the time and being put in that box. And obviously when Jennifer's Buddy came out, there was an incredible amount of focus on you and Diablo being female filmmakers. So yeah. a lot of the attention was there. Has that gotten better, do you think? Or are you still, is it something that still you struggle against? Um, I, I mean, I think... I, I think the the focus on on me as as a woman hasn't really shifted. It's it's probably intensified a bit, actually. Um, here we are talking about it as well. So that's, that's, say again. I said here we are talking about it as well. So it's, well, yeah. I think what it is though is it's um. I understand why people want to have the conversation. You know, um, there's there's a complete absence of women, you know, at award season for the most part, um, when it comes to directors and screenwriters and producers, and then within the craft fields, you know, cinematography and editing and there's sound. I mean, there, there's so many ways that, that the, the great work of women has been overlooked, not just this year, but year after year. And so, um, I understand why people want to have the conversation, um, but it's, um, I think I get frustrated because the longer I have to talk about who I am as a woman, the less time I feel I end up having to, to, to really grapple with who I am as a filmmaker. Somehow, um, somehow the emphasis on the conversation of my femaleness starts to somehow feel reductive when clearly all of the women peers and colleagues I have, we make very different movies from one another. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no such thing as like 
a woman's picture this year with the exception of a star is born in Roma. Um, you know what I mean? Like those are movies about, about women, um, for women to a degree, um, and made by men, you know? Well, I mean, uh, I guess the, uh, the golden age of Hollywood was you know, characterized by films. Absolutely. You know, people like George Cukor, and, but there were women's pictures. I mean, women were- people Totally. Were still, Douglas but, Sirk and yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, and, and again, of course, nobody else, uh, a male director. As a male director, what is it like telling yeah. your story? So, um, yeah. are you a sort of, would you, are you happy in sort of, are you in a, in a better place now in terms of like the films you're making? And because uh, I know with Jennifer and with Ann Flux, you had struggles with the studios. And, yep. Um, is this sort of, is the groove that you're in now with The Invitation and Destroyer, is that a place you're kind of happy with? I, I haven't seen Destroyer yet, so but I'm looking forward to it. Oh, yeah, it's coming, that. it's coming to Australia, I think, pretty soon. I think it is, March. yeah. March, yeah. Yes, in March. Um, yeah, I feel pretty. I, look, I'm, um, I'm an odd bird in this business. You know, like I actually, um, I have yet to make somebody a ton of money. Um, I'd really like to. <laughs> I'd love to be able to say, oh, and that's another thing I can do is make a make a, a movie that that really makes somebody a lot of money. Um, because that's a big part of how you prove your worth in this business. But the fact is I have managed to keep making movies and I'm really hopeful that the reason is, is that the movies are good. Um, they're not for everyone. I don't make movies for everyone. I don't know how, but I do make movies that I hope speak to somebody. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm so fortunate to be able to keep doing this. I feel really um, quite grateful for the, for the fact that, that, um, I've managed to, you know, keep hustling and and keep a career alive. Well, when you make a movie like this for Jennifer's Body, you, you've made a movie that's speaking to people, yeah. which is in the long run a lot more worth than, you know, a blockbuster at the time. Absolutely. You know, play Transformers, Revenge of the Fallen, for example, not to, you know, diss Michael Bay or anything, but <laughs> I think Jennifer's Body probably means more to a group of people than that film might 10 yeah. years later. I think that's really true. <laughs> That could be the uh, the film that makes you know makes you money. Could yeah. the time be right for a sequel? Yeah, actually, somewhere that you at, before the film came out that you had a discussion or may have had a discussion about a potential sequel to this film. Yeah, was that, it, it's hard for me to really see it. I mean, uh, was it an idea at the time? I think there was the hope that the movie was going to do well, and so yeah. I think people. Um, it's doing well now, though, so maybe it's time for. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, it's funny. I can't think of a ton of sequels that I love. Mm -hmm. Um, but in my, you know, I just passed like Godfather 2 at the New Beverly playing, and I was like, well, you know, that's an, that's a, that's a sequel that's even better than the original. Um, but I, I don't know. Yeah, I'd have to think about that. It's hard to know what to do with the story from, from here on out. Yeah. There would be some interesting thought. I mean, would Jennifer be alive? Probably not. Yeah, exactly. It'd have to be something about a doppelganger or a, right, twin, right. a long lost twin some sister. Just, they're just, I mean, there are films that, I mean, like Heather's is an example that they talked about making a sequel for years and years and never yeah. did. I think there, there are certain films that you just have to leave, leave well alone. And yeah. Yeah, yeah and Heather's, I mean, Heather's was a huge inspiration for this movie. Um, I mean, I think it's obvious, but, you know, to me, Heather's was a great example of just like a truly weird movie when, you know, when I revisit it every time I'm like, I can't, can't believe how strange that movie was, but it spoke to me so deeply in terms of that um, mixture of tones Um you know, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to make movies that, that, that make you laugh and then kind of make you cry and then make you scared. You know, that, that, that's not, um, that's not for everybody. And I mean, Heather's was a, was a bomb as well. And I mean, yeah. it is now in the culture. I mean, I'm totally. sure it didn't make, make, make much money at the time, but it's got this sort of rarefied place of sort of love. Oh, yeah. so, God, um, I that movie. Same. <laughs> yeah. But I think Jennifer's body is like, it's on the path. Together. Oh, well, so. thank you.
Yeah. Thank you so much, Karen. For... This was a lovely conversation, and I hope that the screenings go well 